welcome you all here. This is uh, this is week five. This is week five. Today we're going to be talking about the the fourth century. The fourth century is well, I guess they're all important, but fourth century is a particularly rich time in the history of the early church. Uh, a great deal happens. Specifically, Christianity moves from being an uh, outlaw and or fringe movement to being the, uh, the, the first great religion, if you will, of the Roman Empire. So we're going to divide that up into two weeks. Today is primarily an overview of the principal events of that time period. The next week we'll talk about the ramifications, what happened as we go from outlaw movement to, uh, to approved and ultimately official religion of the state, and then the aftermath of that is Christianity spreads throughout the world. Before we begin the study, I'd like to begin with a word of prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for this day that you have allowed us. We thank you for all the mercies that you pour into our lives. Lord, as we gather in your holy house, we ask that your spirit might be present here, might enlighten and enliven our hearts, so even as we study the history of your church, you might continue to teach our hearts, teach our minds, and guide our lives that we may walk in the works prepared for us by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay, so this is the uh, beginning of the fourth uh, uh, century. We do come into a period of time in which uh, the Christian church experiences one of its most dire and uh, bloody persecutions, which I'll talk about presently. Before we do that, um, there's a lot in the news about Christian persecution today, and and, and, and of course that's, that's some of that, um, the risk of being a vaguely political, maybe fear mongering. Some of it may be genuine, but um, I want to talk about what life was like then. Um, this is a not terribly to scale map of the Roman world. The darker blue uh, shows. Places where Christianity prevailed at the beginning of the 4th century, so about the year 301, give or take. Um, the, the blue, the, the dark, or the light blue, is uh, the Christian world in about 600. So we can see how, how rapidly Christianity spreads during that time. At the time in question, the beginning of the 4th century, some historians believe there may, may have been as many as uh, 10%, as as 10% of the population of the Roman Empire is now Christian. So that means one out of every 10 people, which is of course still a minority, but if you think about it, it's a rather significant minority. For example, if we were to say that one out of uh, one out of every ten people in this country were um, Jewish. It means you could go to a population center, and literally, of every ten people you saw, at least one of them would be Jewish. I, I want to compare that to real numbers today to give you an idea of how much that is. Um, in our country right now, according to a 2013 Pew survey study, um, less than two percent of the American population is Jewish. It's less than 2 percent. Now, given a population of some 360, 365 million people, 2 percent is still a large number, but it's only 2 out of every 100 people you'll meet. Fewer than 1 percent is Muslim. Fewer than 1 percent is Muslim in this country. Something closer to between 0.6 and 0.8 percent of this country is Muslim. By the way, it's still a fairly large number given 365 million people. But percentage-wise, it's still a small minority. We're talking about a time, but that, and you measure that in terms of 10 years ago, 15 years ago, is it going up, is it going down, is it changing, is it what? Um, well, let's, let's say that um, between, um, I don't want to go there, uh, of, of the mostly recognized faiths, of the mostly recognized faiths, so here we're bracketing out newer religions and neo-pagan religions that aren't recognized by everyone, 
of the recognized faiths right now in this country, uh, Islam is the fastest growing. At least as of the last study that I've read, Islam is the fastest growing faith. Uh, Christianity is losing some ground. Uh, right now, about 74%, by the way, 74% of the uh, population in this country identifies as some sort of a Christian. That would probably include some groups that more conservative Christians wouldn't consider Christian. But 74% of this country identifies as Christian. But the reason I bring this up is to talk about something that was definitely growing at the beginning of the 4th century, which was the Christian movement. 10% of the population. Now, that number is significant because we're moving into a time when Emperor Diocletian, that's uh, what we think it looked like, or at least the hardest thing it looks like, Emperor Diocletian launched really what was the deadliest and bloodiest of persecutions against the Christian church. And that's significant because he now launches a persecution against 10% of the population of his empire. That's kind of unprecedented. I, I, I mean, imagine if, if we were to say that one out of every ten people in this country is going to be deported, or is going to be incarcerated, or is going to be, in the case of Diocletian, potentially executed. That's the level of persecution which now exists in the Roman Empire. Um, what's interesting about that, what's interesting about that is that persecution did not last very long, and it didn't do a whole lot to quell the spread of Christianity. Christianity continued to grow despite every effort by Emperor Diocletian to stamp it out. As, as a matter of fact, um, the persecution ended in 311 when Diocletian, by the way, was no longer the emperor. It was, by the way, just to the point of information, the first Roman emperor, emperor, um, emperor how was all speaking today? I'm not sure why. First Roman emperor to voluntarily abdicate, something which wouldn't happen again for many centuries. All other Roman emperors either died in office or, more famously, were killed. Um, Diocletian steps down, uh, abdicates in favor of his successor, who was already being groomed for the role, uh, Galerius brings to an end the persecution in 311 when Diocletian actually dies. Um, which is interesting because Galerius is probably the one who encouraged Diocletian to persecute the Christians in the first place. Um, just a few facts there. Uh, you can see them on page one of your handout. Um, 23rd of February, 303, common era, Diocletian orders that the newly built church be destroyed. He demanded that its scriptures be burned, seized uh, uh, precious stores, basically seized the treasury for the Roman Empire, and the next day issues the first edict against Christians. The edict ordered the destruction of all Christian scriptures, all places of worship across the empire, and prohibited Christians from assembling for worship. So, yes, sir. What did they really see as a threat? Um, there, there were a no, there were a number of things that were there were a number of things that were happening. Some of this, by the way, is in response to trouble within the empire. Um, you understand how Rome did its business. We're going to well, any empire really. Say, for example, I want an empire. This is my little country here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to conquer this pew. Now, I have to be careful how I do this, because if I go ahead and I exile all the residents of this pew, I have an empty pew. What fun is that? There's nobody to work. There's nobody to collect taxes from. So what I have to do is I have to somehow convince the people in this pew that I'm in the UK. First generation, I can do that by sheer might. Trust me as your king, treat me as your king, or I kill all of you. After a couple of generations, I have to get them to believe in the system. Now, I conquer this pew and get some loyal followers here, then I conquer this pew. The same thing happens. I want to conquer the whole world, aka this whole center of the church. 
I keep pondering view after view. What happens by the time I get pretty close to the last view? I don't have the resources anymore to keep this thing going. I can't, I can't raise a big enough army. I can't collect enough taxes. Because you see what's happening is I'm having a larger and larger superstructure back at home. I need a larger and larger military force to be able to do this. And I need to employ a lot of that military force out there to keep order. And the further away we are from home, the harder it is to get imperial edicts out there. So it gets to be more and more difficult. What's happening by the beginning of the 4th century is that Rome is beginning to feel the weight of its own imperial success and their internal troubles. What's the best way? What's the best way to unite people? Common enemy. Common, Common enemy. enemy. Common enemy is this story of uh, World War II. Story of countless conflicts. It's a story of a significant portion of this country's uh, uh, in actual movement west. Common enemy. Unites disparate peoples. So, so one of the things that happened in the early Christian church is that they became a governmental scapegoat. By the way, as we talked about in previous sessions, uh, this is a reminder, some of the things that the early Christians were accused of, they were accused of atheism, because they would not believe in the pantheon of gods that was accepted by the Roman Empire. They were accused of lawlessness. Specifically, they were accused of cultural iconoclasm. For example, if you became a Christian, you had to make statements such as, in Christ, there is no difference between a Jew or a Gentile. In Christ, there is no difference between a free person and a slave. In Christ, there is no difference between a man and a woman. That's from Scripture, by the way. Now, imagine what that does to a society if you have a whole lot of people, 10% of the population believing that. Think about the mayhem, if you will, the social mayhem in this country when part of the country began to say it is inappropriate to be able to buy and sell another human being in spite of their skin color. Skin color. Just because a person has a darker skin color than you and comes from a faraway place doesn't give you the right to own them. And the other half of the country says, but that's what our economy is based on. That's what our lifestyle and our culture is based on. You can't take that away from us. It's our right. And by the way, we use religion to support it. So if you can think of that kind of, of, of disruption in relatively civilized times, imagine what's going on here when 10% of the population says, you know, you, you, you become a Christian like us, it doesn't matter if you're a, a slave or not. It doesn't matter if, if you're a, a man or a woman. It doesn't matter what country you come from. We're all the same in Christ. That scene is hugely disruptive. So those are, those are some of the things. There were also a lot of, of, of silly stories, by the way, that were floating around, and kind of fear-mongering things that made me sound all too contemporary, the idea of fear-mongering, you know, take other. You know, some of the silly things that I've heard spoken about folks from other cultures. What, what they said about Christians in those days. Well, you know those Christians, when they get together, you know what they do to worship their God? They've got a great big origin going on. That's what they do. Well, that was one of the accusations. Those Christians, you know what they do when they get together, when they have a sacred meal? They eat their children. That's what they do. These were things that were said about Christians, mostly through a misunderstanding of language, but it also became pretty convenient. You know, if I wanted to make an enemy out of Russ, and I don't really have any good reason to make an enemy out of Russ, well, what's the best way to do that? Start telling lies about him to people who really don't know him anyway, but might see him for whatever reason as an outsider. People who might have relatively neutral feelings about Russ, or maybe just mildly antagonistic feelings because, hey, he plays his music on a real drill tape recorder instead of a CD player. You know, but if I start telling lies, you know, where, you know where Russ gets all those vinyl records from? He steals them. You see? And all of a sudden, 
all of a sudden, if I'm way more charismatic, say, than I really am, I might get you to believe that stuff. And pretty soon we have a scapegoat. I know it's a silly example, but I use a silly example purposely because some of the stuff that they said really was very, very silly, as we might know. But the general population? Just give us 98. Just give us something we can blame our problems on. Just, you know, the risk of sounding political, when you listen to the radio, and you hear somebody say, you know what other does? Once other was a Jew, maybe if you other is a Muslim or a person from a different country or an immigrant or an illegal immigrant, whenever you hear people saying stuff and running those folks to the ground, remember, one, we're full of love people. Two, we might want to take it with a grain of salt and not be quite such a sheep for the wrong shepherd. Just a thought. The other thing you might want to watch out for, by the way, are superlative statements. All Christians gather together and eat their babies. All poor people do this. All rich people do this. All black people do this. All Islamic peoples do this. Watch out for those kind of superlative statements. There's very little all in anything. Um, questions, troubles? Okay. There's trends. Trends? There are trends of behavior in those different cultural environments. Why is it that 40% of the crimes are created by blacks? That's a huge question. Um, and it's probably a question that needs, that can only be answered when you look at other things that surround it. For example, if 40% of crime, and I'm, I'm assuming this statistic is true, I don't know, I haven't studied that, but it could be 40% of crime that are committed by blacks. Let's say that's true. What percentage of black folk live in poverty? What percentage of black folks don't have an education past the sixth grade or past the eighth grade? What percentage of black people are high school dropouts? What percentage of black people come from broken homes? And, and then we begin to have a fuller picture of, of why that of why that is. So anytime we have a statistic or a statistical trend, I would suggest that it cannot be studied in a vacuum. It needs to be studied with its antecedents and its analogs. Fifteen years ago, Bill Cosby came up on the net basically dealing with exactly what you just talked mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. And he has not been able to influence society accordingly. And so you've got to ask the question, why? Why is that not happening? And that takes us back to where you are here in the fourth century. You bet. We love scapegoats. Um, we love to have scapegoats. We love to have people to blame for our problems. And we love to have ways of galvanizing a culture. I don't want to labor that too much. I'll probably come back to it because this whole study is full of that kind of stuff. Um, here's an example. Here's an example of scapegoating. Uh, it's an old example. This is going to sound familiar to you. The other way it was Nero tried the same thing back in, back in the first century, somewhere around 64. <coughs> By the end of February, that same year, by the way, 303, by the end of February, the fire destroyed part of the imperial palace. It was a fire, a suspicious fire. Diocletian was convinced that the culprits were Christians. Just like Nero blamed the Christians for the burning of Rome. No responsible party was ever found, although executions followed anyway. Specifically, if you turn the page, Specifically, as an individual, Peter. His punishment was to be stripped naked, raised up high, salt and vinegar were poured in his wounds, and he was slowly uh, boiled over an open plain. Uh, the executions continued all the way through April of 3003, so February, March, April. And six individuals, including a uh, bishop, were decapitated. So, so here you have now, this is how scapegoating, by the way, works. We start off with a problem, we capitalize on the problem as a way of galvanizing the population, then we need the scapegoat. We need someone to blame them. 
and now we have to execute justice. Or just execute the people. But it doesn't go on forever, and it can't go on forever. And in this case, we see Emperor Marius, the same fellow, by the way, who probably insti instituted all this persecution, rescinds the persecution in 311, announcing that the previous administration's plan had failed. It failed to bring Christians back to traditional religion. Now, what we're going to see is that within 25 years of this persecution's inauguration, the so-called Christian Emperor Constantine would rule the empire by himself. He would reverse the consequences of the persecution edicts, return all, or at least most, of the confiscated property to Christians, and under Constantine's rule, whereas Christianity would not yet quite become the state religion, it would certainly become the preferred religion. By the way, Diocletian was, um, he was demonized by his Christian successors, by subsequent emperors who then were Christians. Um, and in fact, the irony here is that uh, Diocletian's tomb is now inside of the church. Um, let's see. Persecution of Christians, um, not just in Rome, also is uh, in, 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 uh, in Persia, and it's something called the Great Persecution of 340. Uh, Great Persecution of 340, the primary cause of this particular persecution was political. And, and here's how it happened. Do you know the saying, the uh, road to uh, hell is paved with what? Good, good intentions. Well, here's a good intention for you. So, Constantine, Emperor Constantine, who becomes emperor after fighting a, a battle, is very much in favor of Christianity and wants to see Christians protected. Ultimately, he even goes ahead and he credits his becoming emperor to Jesus. So he writes to the government of Persia. And he says to them, well, you can see what he says, he's probably in your notes there. I'm not mistaken. He writes the following. I rejoice to hear that the fairest provinces in Persia are adorned with Christians. Since you are so powerful and pious, he writes to the king, I commend them to your care and leave them in your protection. Well, you may have been sincere. I want to believe you as a sincere, but to say that it backfired is an understatement. We have this fellow, Shakur II, who is the Shah at that point of Persia, and he is furious, absolutely furious, and he begins his own persecution of Christians. And he had his own scapegoating campaign, it says right there. First accusation brought against Christians was that they were aiding the Roman enemy. Sean decides he's going to double the taxation on Christians, hold the bishop responsible for collecting it. Of course, the bishop knows that most Christians at this point in Persia don't have any money. Bishop Simon, we're told, refused to be intimidated. He branded the tax as unjust and declared, I'm no tax collector. But a shepherd in the Lord's flock. The second degree from Shakar ordered the destruction of churches. The execution of clergy who refused to participate in a national worship of the sun. Bishop Simon was seized, brought before the Shah. He was offered gifts to make a token of BCF to the sun. In other words, Shah brings this bishop, Shah recognizes the Bishop is powerful, wants to avoid executing him. He says, look, all you have to do is make some gifts to the sun god, and by the way, we'll give you the gifts to give to the sun god. Bishop Simon refuses. To make a very, very long story short, what happened is that the Shah then brings in a whole lot of other Christians, clergy and everyday people, by the hundreds, and says, look, Simon, if you guys don't worship the sun, I'm going to kill your people. I'm going to kill your people. 
Simon continues to refuse. The people, at least most of them, continue to refuse. And they are executed one by one. You can see, you can read there what happens. Five bishops, 100 priests were beheaded before his eyes, and lastly Simon is put to death. That's the Persian persecution. Questions? Comments? So, the, uh, the time begins to turn. It's rather interesting. The time begins to turn in terms for largely political reasons. Something called the Battle of Million Bridge. This is where Constantine is fighting against another Roman. Constantine is fighting against Maxentius. As I mentioned before, Rome is divided. Rome has lots of people claiming the throne. This has been going on for quite some time. Constantine decides that he is the rightful ruler. Maxentius decides that he is the rightful ruler. They do battle. Now there's a legend. You probably heard this legend. The legend is that prior to the battle, Constantine looks up in the sky and he sees a cross. And on the cross he sees some writing. Angioto Mica, which you often see in Latin, in hoc signo in chess. By this sign, you will conquer. So here's Constantine, claiming he looks up into the sky, sees a cross, under it is written, by this sign, you will conquer. The legend goes on to say that Constantine ordered all of his troops to put the Christian symbol, the Cairo, on their shields. And he won the battle. Now, it's kind of interesting to note that after this battle, which is an historical event, Constantine ordered the building of something called the Arch of Constantine, which is still there to this day, and is filled with religious symbolism and religious inscription. And Constantine does indeed credit his victory to divine power. However, there is on this entire Arch of Constantine not a single mention of Christ, not a single mention of Christian religion. So, what I would suggest to you is that the story of Constantine looking up into the sky and seeing a cross and seeing writing under the cross that says, by this sign you will conquer, is most likely a legend. Probably a legend invented for political reasons. Now, you know what those words mean? Hmm? By this sign, by this sign, you shall conquer. Or, or literally, by this sign, you shall be victorious. Um, that's um, most likely, most likely as Constantine begins to be more and more in favor of Christianity, he, and when you're the emperor, you can do this. He creates his own legend. Now, none of you would ever do this. Heaven knows I wouldn't do this. But there are some people who, when they go back and tell stories from years ago, they edit a little bit. Oh, heck, I'll admit it, don't you? Especially when I was a kid and I came home late. And my father's there late, so why are you late, son? I might have edited the story. Just a little. Make it a little more favorable to my side of things. Of course, now that I'm old and my father's even older, you know, it's kind of fun to tell the truth about what really happened. But uh, people do have a way of editing the past. And by the way, if you're a military victor, you really have an opportunity to edit the past. You know, it's been said that the victors, those who are victorious, write the history books. So that's just a thought on. Constantine and his sign. Um, and here I'll just take a little break. Uh, just a note on Christian symbolism. Um, what's that? Professional Christians need not answer. <laughs> what is that thing? There's two letters more than Christ. Yeah. We're kind of trying to keep the professional Christians out of it, but uh, <laughs> sorry, that's okay. That's all right. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind, uh, kind row. It's two Greek letters. 
and it is in fact a Christogram. Think, if you will, of a monogram, but not necessarily with the first and you know last, but taking two letters out of the name of Jesus, something recognizable and making a symbol out of it. This wasn't the only kind of thing like that in those days, but this was an early symbol of the Christian church, Cairo. Uh, um, what about this one? What's that?
Um, this is going to make some of you annoyed. Some of you are going to make outright angry, maybe. Hopefully it won't direct that at me, but if you do, it's okay. I've got broad shoulders. Um, we're talking about statistics. Well, you're talking about the trends for the statistics about growing muscle population. Why, why is it it's, it's less than 1%, but why is Islam growing, you suppose, in this country? Having more children. Okay, more babies, they have more kids. Yeah, Protestants, Protestants, especially middle and upper class Protestants, tend to limit the size of their families, not always, but they tend to. That's part of the reason. However, Islam is growing through conversion, largely. Why? Why do you suppose? Hold on. Economic, economic foundation says that if I'm a Christian, this ain't working for me, I'm going to try something else. Okay, all right. Plan A isn't working, go for plan B, even if it's a spiritual realm. Sure, a lot of people jump ship, so to speak, religious, religiously, politically, philosophically, when one thing doesn't seem to be working, they try something else. But the interesting thing of that is that the Muslim world, around the whole world, mm -hmm. all the Muslim nations, economically, most of them are flat on air parts. True, true. Of course, the surrounding areas that aren't Muslim are probably flat on their rears as well. Um, again, in order to parse the statistics out, we have to look at the connected statistics of the antecedents. Um, what I want to suggest, at least in this country, there are a lot of reasons, but some of it has to do with um, passion. Have you ever spoken to a new convert to anything? Have you ever, have you ever met a person who just became a Christian and really take it seriously? Man, they can't stop talking about it. That's, it's been said there's no one more zealous than a new convert. You see, you see, the reality, I believe, is that for a lot of people, Christianity is humdrum. It's boring. It's worn out. Keep in mind that I come from a part of this country where we, it's, 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 it's almost like going to Europe. You know, I used to be at a church on a main street, Main Street Orange. Church had a 1,500 seat sanctuary. Had about 25 people worshiping there at one Sunday service. 25 of church closed. After 298 years of ministry, the church closed. Still more for that now. Okay? Well, up and down that main street, up and down that main street, which went through three different towns, one enormous, beautiful edifice after another. One more gorgeous and elaborate than the next. And just about all of them were empty. A lot of them were closed. Because the population just didn't go to church. Or if they went to church, they didn't go to that kind of church. They went to churches that met storefronts. They went to churches that had names like Assembly of God and Prophecy of Jesus Christ Incorporated. They didn't go to churches with names like First Presbyterian, St. Mark's Anglican, and Grace Lutheran. Because somewhere along the line, those churches wore themselves out. They lacked passion. <coughs> they lacked staying power. They lacked something. Now, this isn't a course in how to grow a church, and I, of all people, am not qualified to teach such a course. But what I can suggest is that Christianity in this country, in a lot of it, has lost its fervor, has lost its... How do I know this to be true from personal experience? Well, I've got this habit, and if ever any of you go out to lunch or dinner with me, you'll see this is true. I have this really bad habit. Some people say it's a bad habit. I sit in restaurants and say grace. Even if it's a bar. Even if I'm going to drink a bunch of beer, I still sit down and say grace. Thank you, God, for the food, and really, God, thank you for the beer, because I'm trying to 
friend said, beer is proof God loves us. <laughs> and I'm quite serious about that. At least to say thank you for it. And I have had experience of waiters or waitresses coming up to me and saying, oh, excuse me, sir, are you, are you okay? Do you have a headache? Can I get you a towel? Which I'm happy that they're attentive, but it speaks volumes and they're so unaccustomed to see anybody bow their heads and pray before a meal. Because heaven knows we don't do that in public. I don't think I've ever seen a fervent Muslim not give thanks for their food. I don't think I've ever seen a Muslim eat a meal without first saying some form of thanks for this food. Um, I think one of the reasons why we have, what else is growing by the way besides Islam? Uh, Neo-paganism. Neo-paganism. Uh, Wicca. Uh, mystery religions. Pseudo-Gnosticism. Growing by leaps and bounds. Because people see it as alive. People see it as a source of power. People see it as a source of something that's going to transform their lives. And I bring all of this up because this is what's happening in Rome. Constantine recognizes the old ways are going away. For a lot of people, you know, Rome. So, Jupiter, Saturn, you know, all those things that we think of as planets, that they were supposed to think of as gods, were rapidly becoming you know, philosophical constructs. People didn't so much worship Jupiter anymore. They kind of thought of him as a Delic concept that proposed poetry about. And, and, and that's what Constantine recognized. Yeah, yeah, but in the, in the superstitious, uneducated masses, they were still worshiping the old gods. And the arch conservative, very wealthy people were making a big show of worshiping the old gods. But the bulk of the people right in the middle were, quite frankly, too busy going about their business to worry about it one way or another. Constantine recognized that Christianity had to appeal for the poor. Christianity had to appeal for the rich. Christianity had an appeal for the uneducated masses. Christianity had an appeal for the great scholars. If nothing else, Constantine could recognize, hey, this is the new and upcoming thing. And I would theorize that is why he decided to support Christianity. Um, do with that information with you little questions. Okay, so the um, session of Constantine was a turning point for the Christian church. Um, Christian, Constantine supported the church financially, built various facilities, granted, see if this sounds familiar, granted exemption from certain taxes to clergy, promoted Christians to high ranking offices, and returned the property that was confiscated during the reign of depletion. 1313, Constantine issued something called the Edict of Milan, reaffirming legally tolerance for Christians, and again returning any previously confiscated, uh, confiscated property in churches. Now what's interesting about this is that under Constantine, the Christian movement, because legally it wasn't a religion, the Christian movement gradually underwent a transformation from this previously underground, shadowy kind of movements, where you took your life and your hands to be part of it, to becoming an officially sanctioned religion within the Roman Empire. Now, that's kind of hard for us to conceptualize because I just mentioned that 74% of the population of this country, 74% of the population of this country identifies as Christian. But imagine, if you will, a movement an underground movement. Any underground movement. Well, let me pick a hotbed one for Florida. Um, pot smoking. Pot smoking. Now, I know no one here has ever smoked any pot. You wouldn't tell me if you did. Or if you admitted it, I would say you didn't inhale. <laughs> <laughs> but, unless trends really reverse themselves, 
unless trying to reverse themselves, I would suggest to you that there probably will come a time in the history of this nation where smoking of marijuana is viewed kind of like the consumption of alcohol. It's probably going to become eventually socially acceptable. It's already socially acceptable in a lot of circles. And what's interesting is you talk to all the people who smoke pot, not that I know anyone who smokes pot, but if you spoke to people who smoke pot, they would actually even tell you, yeah, pot's okay, but, but you know, don't be mainlining. Pot's okay, but don't be taking anything you've got to inhale up your nose. Mm -hmm. And he said that the way they get young people, they also say that pot has much less effect than alcohol. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the ways that they get, particularly high school kids. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it's, 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 kind of, it's kind of interesting, you know. I mean, again, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a medical person, so I, I don't know. And okay. if I did, if I did have personal experience with this kind of thing, I probably wouldn't share it. Uh, the, the reality is that if you smoke marijuana, it's going to affect your behavior. Like alcohol, different individuals have different tolerances. There are some folks who can smoke an entire, what do they call one thing? Uh, and smoke an entire joint, and it has almost no effect on them. But, and that's probably because they've smoked a lot of other joints in the past. You know, and there are other individuals who just have a couple of puffs and they're already acting uh, a whole different than they usually do. And, and isn't it the same thing with alcohol? Right? There are some people who can drink a six pack of beer and you can't tell any real personality difference. And there are other people who have one or two beers or a single shot of hard liquor and are already acting in an uncharacteristic fashion. I, I don't know, honestly. And, and, and the studies argue with each other over which is more potent. And the definition, by the way, of potency sometimes changes. But what is true, whether you agree with it or not, is that most likely the trend right now is towards acceptance. And I'm not saying that that's right or wrong. You know, there was certainly a time in this nation when alcohol was, at least in some circles, completely socially acceptable and illegal. So these things, these things, um, they change. They change. But the point is, what, what happens when you go from a movement to a societally acceptable? You see, one of the things about uh, the legalization of alcohol is that it changed the culture. When was the last time anybody you knew ever went to a speakeasy? Does anybody know what a speakeasy is? Some people do not like the separation of church and state. We definitely talk a lot about it. 
one of the things that happened is Constantine got involved in Christianity. There was no separation of church and state. Case in point. In 316, Constantine acted as the judge in a North African dispute concerning something called the Donatist controversy. What's the Donatist controversy? Uh, Donatists were people who looked at their fellow Christians and uh, said, well, say, for example, uh, Phyllis had been rounded up by uh, Diocletian, and, and one of Diocletian's henchmen said to Phyllis, Phyllis, you're a Christian, right? And um, Phyllis, of course, says, well, yes, of course I am. And now the henchman says, well, Phyllis, I'm going to give you a chance to recant that position, so please fall down on your knees and worship the sun god. And Phyllis is shaking her head, but then the henchman is now commanding a small legion of people, and they have really pointy swords. Now, the real Phyllis would never do this. But say our hypothetical Phyllis is, oh, okay. I don't want to die here, so she gets down on her knees and she starts worshiping the sun god. But she's not really worshiping the sun god, she's doing it with her fingers crossed behind her back, and then you know, I'm and they're not really sorry, Jesus, I'm really sorry, Jesus, I don't want to die, I'm really sorry, Jesus. Well, once that persecution was over, and Phyllis says, oh, goody, I can come back to church now, the Donatist would say, oh, no, you don't. Oh, no, you don't. You forsook Christ. You're no longer welcome here. You see, there are those of us who are willing to die. There are those of us, I have relatives and friends who did die because they would not forsake Christ. They got speared for the sake of Jesus. Phyllis, you are, you are too cowardly to say that. You're not welcome. Now, that became a controversy because, on the one hand, we can read in the New Testament, Jesus saying, hey, those who deny me before my, for men, I will what? Deny before my Father in heaven. On the other hand, Jesus is also all about forgiving. And when no less a light than Peter, in the eye of a servant girl, says not once, not twice, but three times, I don't know the man, Jesus turns around and restores Peter. Does he not? So there's a controversy. What do we do with these people who, for fear of their lives, forsook Christ? Just like the disciples probably forsook Christ. So there's a controversy, and Constantine acts as the judge in this case. Maybe even more significantly, it is Constantine, granted the urging of various factions of the church, but nonetheless, officially speaking, it is Constantine that summons the Council of Nicaea in 325. Now, why is that interesting, and why is it important, and why is it significant? A lot of reasons, but not the least of which is that at this particular point, Constantine was effectively setting himself up as the titular head of the Christian church. He's in fact not baptized. Constantine is not baptized. He is not therefore welcome at the Eucharistic table. He can't actually attend most of the service if he's not baptized. Yet he has set himself up as the ruler of the Christian church, at least in terms of its temporal issues. Constantine, in fact, we're told, maybe spurious, but it sounds like him, when all the bishops gather at the Council of Nicaea, he greets the bishops and says, well, you know, I'm a bishop too. Well, it's not that surprising that Constantine, as a secular emperor, would do such things. What's a little more surprising to me, what's a little more telling to me, is that the church, by and large, went along with it. Constantine said, okay, we got some controversies here. Only people need to come here. Constantine invited, we are told, 1,800 bishops to the Council of Nicaea. He didn't get 1,800 bishops to show up, but he invited them. Um, just a little bit of, a little bit of uh, background on that. Let's see. I'm upside down, that's where I am. And there we go. It's an early mosaic, a 
Thomas would be no good. Uh, no the halo? No the cross of his crown? Constantine um, was not baptized until he was on his deathbed. Constantine did not commit to Christ in a formal way until he was on his deathbed. Now, when asked about this, as he was getting older, Your Majesty, you identify as a Christian. In many ways, you're the leader of the Christian world. All the great bishops all grant obeisance to you. Why have you never truly become a Christian? In the way that every other person who wants to become a Christian must. His answer, we recall, is that he said, well, you know, in addition to being a follower of Jesus, I am also the leader of a great nation. And when you are the leader of a great nation, you sometimes must do things that the Lord Jesus would consider to be a sin. Just in the course of doing your job, you sometimes have to do things like kill, lie, cheat, steal, all of those things that he knew pretty well, Jesus would not approve of. And you see, once I'm baptized, reason Constantine, once I'm baptized, I don't want to go having to sin again and therefore lose my salvation. So I want to hold off in the last moment to get baptized. And then see somebody shaking their head. Yes. Well, you see, the reality is that there was a strong component of the Christian church. They believe that after you were baptized, you couldn't get any more forgiveness. How is that for a completely different thought? Those of us as Lutherans who grew up saying, you know, every single Sunday, Sunday in and Sunday out, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you. And then expectantly, expectantly waiting for the pastor to say, in the stead of by the command of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I announce unto you what? Grace, forgiveness. How alien it sounds to us. How totally alien the idea, well, okay, you're a sinner. You're, you're a sinner. And, and, and God will forgive you. So now get baptized. Now you're a follower of Jesus. Oh, you sinned again. Uh, sorry. One time deal. Now I've got to tell you, I've, I've studied this stuff through and through, and I can't quite, I can, I can get the facts in my mind, I, I can't quite figure out how that really worked, unless they were just a whole lot more pure than we are, or thought they were. But that was the belief, and apparently Constantine held some belief like that, because he did not want to be baptized until the very end, recognizing it was very likely that he would have to sin to carry out his function as the emperor. So he waited. At least that's what he said. So, don't you think that has some merit since David was told not to build a temple because of his past temple? Solomon was to build a temple. Yeah, well, what's interesting, what's interesting about the story of David, what's interesting about the story of David is the story unfolds thusly. David gets it in his mind. I want to build a house for the Lord. I don't even know how that is. And he then tells the prophet Nathan. And you know, when we talk about this, David and sin, there's plenty of sin, and it's not all the obvious stuff. It's not just murder and adultery. And here it goes. So Nathan shows up. What, is, what does Nathan say when David says, I want to build a house for the Lord? What's the first thing Nathan says? What's his reaction? Exactly. Building plan! Beautiful! That's what we need around here, a good building plan. Nathan the prophet. You know, the same Nathan, by the way, who said, uh, uh, you the man. Nathan goes ahead. So I guess see and David pretty close. Nathan just blithely says, okay. And it is then in a dream that God comes to Nathan and says something like, Nathan, Nathan, Nathan. No. That's not what I want. Go tell David, first of all, am I a man that I really need a house? Do you think I really need a house? In your language, the heavens are my throne. The earth is my footstool. I don't 
don't really need a house. You know, all the time my essence, as it were, travel about in the tent and seem to bother you so much. And did I complain about that? No. You go tell David, after you told him that, I'm not requiring to build a house. Instead, God says to Nathan, tell David, I will build a house out of him. But, since you people need a house so much, David's son, legitimate son, will build a house for him. Now, the reason I bring that up and answer your question is because although argument is frequently made that David didn't get to build a house because of his past uh, uh, the murder and, and the adultery which leads up to that murder, um, in reality, God does something much greater than David. God does something a whole lot greater than David. God uses David to be the ancestor of the Messiah. He's humanly speaking. So it's 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 kind of it's kind of interesting. Do I think there's some precedent? Which do I think there's some precedent for hey, you were baptized, there's no more forgiveness? Um, I think there's historical precedent for because a significant portion of the population of Christianity believed that at the time. However, I would suspect that the biblical precedent on which that theology is based is somewhat shaky because what we recognize from the behavior of Jesus is that God's grace, God's ability to forgive, far exceeds humanity's ability to sin. For example, we would read, first, a whole polemic on how to live. A whole polemic on how to love each other, how terribly important that is, immediately followed by, and when any of you fall into sin. Wait a minute, if, it's just when, when you fall into sin, knowing it's going to happen, we have an advocate with the Father. So, the reality, the essence of Christianity, at least as we have come to understand it now, is grace, is forgiveness, is the propitiation, if you will, to use some real good biblical, and by the way, also Lutheran terms, um, the propitiation against what Paul would call God's just wrath. So, that's kind of the theological answer to that, I guess. Um, okay, Council of Nicaea. So, some dispute as to how many people were actually there, but it's somewhere around 300. You can read that for yourself. Uh, various uh, primary source historians, all of whom were there, by the way, had a different count. Kind of like four different ushers counting differently how many people were in church on Sunday. I know that doesn't happen here. Um, <clears throat> okay, pretty good government deal, by the way. Yes, I'm intentionally trying to get your minds thinking this way. Pretty good government deal. If you were you were summoned, you were given free passage, free lodging for yourself, and as big as an as big an entourage as you wanted to bring. That's how you got the Council of Nicaea. So chances are there were been way more than 1800, just not all bishops. Um, if you look on the page, you will see the agenda. The agenda of the synod which convenes the Council of Nicaea is known to us, it's there written for us, and just a few of these things we're going to go through right now. Um, the primary problem, the primary issue that is the instigating factor for the Council of Nicaea is something called the, the, the Arian question. The Arian question. The Arian question is named after a presbyter by the name of Arius. He's not the fellow who invented it. It's not his unique theology. However, being a rather eloquent writer, he was a major component of what was ultimately seen as the heretical side in the question. Now, as modern Christians, assuming that you mostly worship here at a Lutheran church, we have this understanding of God which Non-Christians to this day sometimes find puzzling. So, for example, we know that Jesus is God, right? Jesus is God. Uh, true statement. Okay, that's it. What's all you know, right? But isn't it interesting that in the New Testament we have examples of Jesus praying? 
To whom does Jesus pray? Oh, so the Father, Abba, as Jesus says, is God, right? Now, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and his disciples saying, Jesus, you can't leave us. It's a rough world out there. Come on, Jesus, don't go away. And Jesus says, unless I go, unless I go, I cannot descend to you. The paraclete, the counselor, the advocate, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is uh, God. So those outside of the Christian faith said, okay, I get it, so you guys are tribeists, right? Say what? You know, tribeists, people who believe in three gods. And God is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. I mean, that sounds like three to me. No, it's one God. I mean, you, you get the idea. It's very, very difficult to explain to people. In fact, it's so difficult to explain that Christians have been arguing over for years. Well, here in the beginning part of the 4th century, and actually going back already to the 3rd century, there was a thought floating around. A philosophical understanding that kind of worked like this. God the Father existed from before time. God the Father made time. God the Father existed all by himself. Then at some point in primordial history, God made, or begot, if you prefer, a son, the only begotten son. So although the numbers and the amount of time are impossible for us mortals to understand, the thought goes that here is some nondescript portion of eternity in which God the Father exists by himself. And at some point during that portion of eternity, God begets his son. Now the reason for this separates out of a number of other sub-controversies. Did God create God the Son simply because that is the nature of God to do so? Or did God create God the Son specifically for the purpose of redeeming humanity? Anyway, that kind of thinking, which has come down to be known as Arianism, after this priest Arius, suggests that God the Son is subordinate, having been created later, than God the Father. Anybody dizzy yet? Anybody following me? Okay. Now, the problem with that is that the prevailing scholarly opinion was that although Jesus was, or is, the begotten Son of God, he was begotten from eternity. In other words, although he's begotten, as in begotten, not made, he has still been around since the beginning. And now if you're not at least somewhat dizzy, you're way smarter than I am. Because what we have is a situation where Jesus was begotten, yet always was. And that's the prevailing attitude. And those who followed Arius said that's ridiculous. How can that be? Either he's begotten or he's not. And that, brothers and sisters, is the controversy that sets into play the Council of Messiah. Now, you, you may ask yourself, well, what's the big deal? I mean, does it matter that much? Well, let's talk about how much it mattered. Um, let's see. I'll push this along here quite a bit. That's uh, artist tradition of artists. We have no idea. Like, all of these, we have no idea what look like. That's some artist tradition of um, costume is way out of sync at the time, by the way. Um, so here's the thing about Arius. This little quote there that I wrote from Constantine, it's on my page 8, I hope it's on your page 8 too, but anyway. Uh, Constantine, Constantine, by the way, remember is the convener of the Council of Nicaea. After the church decided that Arius was uh, full of it, Constantine decides, in addition, if any writing composed by Arius should be found, it should be handed over to the flames, so that not only will the wickedness of his teaching be obliterated, but nothing will be left 
even to remind anyone of him. And I hereby make a public order that if someone should be discovered to have hidden a writing composed by Arius, and not to have immediately brought it forward and destroyed it by fire, his penalty shall be death. As soon as he has discovered this offense, he shall be submitted for capital punishment. Now, the reason I suppose Constantine is so hot and bothered about this is because the Council of Bishops felt that a wrong belief, a kind of a heterodoxy in terms of understanding of God, could potentially lead one to eternal damnation. So Constantine decides to fix the problem by enforcing proper belief and proper possession or dispossession of outlaw writings with the death penalty. Now, here's Constantine trying to defend a pure understanding of Jesus. You know, the same Jesus to whom a woman caught in the act of adultery was brought and disarmed the rightful accusers. The same Jesus who, by the way, earlier restored Peter. The same God, by the way, who had to set Peter right in terms of his understanding in terms of his relationship with the Gentiles. The same God who, or Jesus if you prefer, who met Saul on the road to Damascus and said, Saul, stop persecuting me. I have a real work for you. Constantine decides the best way to handle this problem is by outlawing writings, you know, shades of Fahrenheit 451, outlaw the writings and make it a capital offense to be in possession of them. Just a thought, maybe, not that I want to be political or anything, but just a thought is what happens when human government gets involved with Christianity. Just a thought. Um, any questions on this? Questions, problems, troubles? Okay, well, let's take you back just a little bit. The rest of the Council of Nicaea. Um, so the big question is this, is this, uh, this RA question. We know how it was resolved. It was resolved with more or less what passes for our current understanding of Trinity. The chief document that comes out of the Council of Nicaea is something called the Nicene Creed. There are a couple of versions of this, by the way. There's a 325 version, there's a 381 version. They do not agree with each other exactly. We'll talk about that next week. We'll talk about the beginnings of the split between East and West. Although 1054 is typically given as the date of that great schism. In fact, the beginnings of it are already in the fourth century, if not earlier. Uh, other issues with Council of Nicaea the date of the celebration of Easter, the Miletian schism, which is just more of the same nature of God's stuff. Um, various matters of church discipline, which resulted in the earliest of church canons. Um, there's a list of some of them there. Um, church structures, beginnings of hierarchy, dignity of the clergy, the issues of ordination, all level of suitability of behavior and background for clergy. For example, we might not want to go ahead and hold tax collectors to be clergymen. We might not want to let people who are reformed prostitutes into the church. I don't know how it goes. Um, reconciliation of the left. There's that down a bit again. Establishing norms for public repentance and penance. Readmission to the church of heretics and schismatics. In other words, you are not part of the orthodoxy and orthodoxy, but you repent. Do we let you back in? And how serious does it have to be before we have to rebaptize you? Okay. Just a thought. Is that, that's, that's a lot of, you know, we, today we think of such things as appalling, right? I mean, no matter how horrible something might be, you probably never think of rebaptizing. And yet here is the fourth century. Interestingly enough, they use kind of a works righteousness leader. Just a little bit of a sin. Eh, you don't have to get your baptism, it's okay. Your baptism's so good. Major, major heresy? Yeah, we're going to have to rebaptize you. Um, if you were a priest or a bishop who fell into 
this kind of schismatic heresy, and you desire to be that, you're allowed to be that following your repentance, you would probably have to be reordained. Uh, another issue we probably have with something with today. Um, Liturgical practice. We'll talk about that next week. We're beginning to see more and more structure within the liturgy, more and more standardized ways of doing things. Um, the practice of standing in prayer during the liturgy. What we're going to discover, by the way, is that a lot of our liturgical postures, a lot of our liturgical forms, actually derive from the Roman court. That's for next week. Um, let's see. We already talked about the Nicene Creed. Um, Is there anything else I need to talk about here? No, I think we're going to leave it on that and not open it up to questions. We're actually done on time. Yes? Transubstantiation 
won't happen for hundreds of years yet. Understanding. Understanding is something perhaps tantamount to a journey through the desert. And when we are focused on leading the God's Holy Spirit, that may be when God leads us in a more straight path, as opposed to circuitously wandering around a space the size of Rhode Island for four years. Um, questions? The triune God notion, uh, I finally came to grips with it by thinking that there are three personas of God. As, as a single entity, he is God, okay? And his mindset to be working as the Father, the creator of physical creation, his mindset to be focused on the spiritual side of the creation, which is Jesus, and he communicates with us through his persona as the Spirit. And each one reinforces the others. And a metaphor that I came up with that deals with this is if you could picture a chalice, okay, and look at one side of the chalice, it looks like the profile of a face. Hmm. Looking at the other side of the chalice, which is another face looking back at it. And I pursue that these two faces of the Father and the Son, together defining the chalice that contains the waters of baptism, which is the Holy Spirit. In the beginning, there was the Word. So all of this, the three personas, existed from the beginning of God's self-creation. Well, other than the self-creation part, that's more or less the, the, the last statement, it's more or less the conclusion of the Council of Nicaea, although I will suggest to you two things. One is that if you could throw a couple of words in there, like Greek words like hypostasis, <laughs> you know, you'd you, you really just pretty much sound like you have a doctor of theology again. You know? um, the other thought is, historically, anybody who spent too much time trying to define the Trinity, at least during this period, usually wound up being branded as a heretic. <laughs> Actually, that's really what happened to, to, to Arius and his followers. They're trying to figure this stuff out. They're trying to wrap finite minds around the infinites. And whenever you do that, you'll likely come up with a statement that somebody else can poke holes in. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not that much different from what I was talking about, you know, the misappropriation of individual scriptures to prove a point. Um, you know, and I, and I would say this growing up as a, as, a, as, a, as a Lutheran, but I kind of like that, uh, you know, S done S diagram. Old, old, old time Lutherans don't want to talk about it. It's kind of like a wheel. In the center is the word Deus. You know, on the top you've got Pompey, and then you've got uh, Philae, and then you've got Spiritus, and you've got S, S, non S, you know, they are, but they're not. Yeah. That visual is probably the best pictogram I can find for it. But as soon as we get too, we try to get too heady about it, well, we're likely to run into all kinds of interesting problems. Next week, we'll discover, as we look at the two different versions of the Nicene Creed, the 325 version versus the 381 version, we'll discover how even very, very well thought out theology, specifically the theology of what became the Roman Catholic Church, and the theology of what would become the Orthodox Church, actually vary to this day. To this day, what, some 1600 years, 700 years later, in terms of the role of the Holy Spirit. Where does the Holy Spirit come from? How does it get there, so to speak? Um, so, so, yeah, all of these kinds of things are, um, I believe they are developmental, and they are developmental in God's time. The, some of the issues which we look back at and say, how could they be so stupid as to basically try to stone each other, figuratively, maybe literally, over such things, Recognize that those are issues that have largely since passed from our consciousness. Now, I could turn this around and say, hey, at least they were thinking about it. On the other hand, there are issues that these folks in the fourth century, they're thinking about, which folks won't be thinking about in the 11th or 12th centuries. Um, we'll, we'll see a little more of that. Any, any other questions? I would comment on the question. Uh, Going back to your comment about praying in public or 
Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Good. But, <laughs> Maybe it's just the way I look, I don't know. Oh, yeah. A slightly green powder or something, I don't know. But I have had, on uh, many occasions, the situation where the server will <coughs> approach the table and realize the brain stop all the reference from the prayer and then you continue to get degrees after you finish. That's good. My question is, maybe it was in the bar when you were praying that they were asking me if you were saying, because I don't pray with them with fear. Okay. <laughs> Could be, I don't know. Um, oh, I will tell you, I'm at least as great over my beer as I have for the deal, so. That's what makes you lose There you go. Um, yeah, in my, in my view, I, I didn't this like fault that person because of what, what I, I mean, fault is such an ugly word, but, but I would, if I had to fault anything, it's a prevailing culture that just doesn't. It just doesn't occur to people, oh, somebody might be giving thanks, even in a, even in a restaurant or a tavern. Just a bit at the end of that weekend, when my three granddaughters came out, the preschool that they went to taught them, which I happen to the Lord is good to me, and so I think the Lord will. That was their favorite one, even when we went out to dinner. We okay. all sing together. You know, okay, cool. There are a few people who choose. <laughs> yeah, well, they, 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 they might. might. They might. Well, I, think it's, I think it's okay to be a peculiar person for the sake of the Lord. Sure. <laughs> Others? Questions? Comments? Okay, so next week we're going to talk about we're going to talk about the specifics of going from outlaw movement or near outlaw movement to recognize sanctioned religion, ultimately to official religion and the spread of Christianity. What that does in terms of our liturgy, our uh, ceremonial process, our understanding of doctrine, nothing happens in a vacuum. And, um, and we'll just touch upon a little bit about where Christianity went back in the fourth century. Okay, let's close with a little prayer for tonight. Father, we thank you for this time you've allowed us together. Lord, it is good to gather in your house, it is good to discuss, it is good to learn, it is good to see where your people have been before. Lord, I suppose we are most concerned with where you are leading us now. Father, even as we trust that your spirit led your church in those early years, even as we trust your spirit shaped and refined and guided, we ask that you might continue to shape and refine and guide our walk, both as individuals and as a church body. Lord, as we depart from this place, we ask that we might be not only kept safe, but also guided in the ways that you have set before us, that we may continue to be bringers of light and sharers of good news. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you all.